Hi, I'm Katie Taylor. I'm an amateur boxer and I live in Bray, County Wicklow in Ireland. This is amateur boxing in Ireland in the 21st century. Not that there's anything particularly amateur about it anymore. The leading fighters are among the highest paid sports people in the land. They're part of sophisticated scientific training programs for mind and body. They even get flown to Los Angeles for television commercials. We ain't done yet, man. We ain't done yet, man. Yeah, simple. It's Ireland's most successful international sport by far, with the boxers winning more Olympic medals than every other sport put together. But underneath this high-tech golden veneer lies a remarkable sporting tale. That there is an Irish Amateur Boxing Association at all is some feat. That it celebrates its centenary replete with a national stadium and a thriving network of clubs from 32 counties representing communities from all sides of social and sectarian divides elevates the history of the IABA into something of a sporting epic. Now, we are boxing, remember. Not professional boxer. It's a different sport completely. I, I, I'm not uh, very fond of professional boxing because I, I think it's too vicious, completely too vicious. <laughs> Amateur boxing is not. It's the art of self-defense. If you read a book, that's what it tells you. The art of self-defense. It's much truer and real than professional boxing in many ways. There's a humanity and a dignity and um, there's a courage involved in it that, that's just so pure. The gentlemen of Victorian England believed that professional boxing was a sport for the depraved and stained by gambling. So they invented their own code. Amateur boxing was conceived as a gentleman's sport, a bit like fencing, in which winning depended on skill and craft, as opposed to the professional game that largely relied on the ability of one man to batter another senseless. And by taking away any possibility of getting paid to fight, it also placed the sport outside the reach of the working class. Everybody talks about professionalism and the professionalization of sport, but of course the truth of it is that people have always been paid for playing sport. It, it, there is nothing new about this concept. What is new is the idea of amateurism, and amateurism is something uh, which came out of the, the ethos of, of Victorian England, uh, and the idea that Amar, uh, to, to love sport, w was enough. You didn't need to get paid for it because uh, if you were a middle class professional or someone from uh, the upper classes, you wanted to maintain control of your sport and you did not want to share it with working class people, so you tried to exclude them. Amateur boxing thrived in the British armed forces and police forces, and also in the great public schools of England. And this is how amateur boxing came to Ireland, through the British Army, the Royal Irish Constabulary, and Trinity College. Amateur tournaments were staged principally in and around Dublin, and in 1911, at a meeting in Beggar's Bush Barracks, the Irish Amateur Boxing Association was formed. The outbreak of World War I, then the Easter Rising of 1916, and the War of Independence that followed effectively put an end to a sport which was dominated by the armed forces. Sport was certainly not a, a major priority in those days. It was, you know, settling into the new state and establishing the new administrative structures. Matters were very, very volatile at that time. I mean, the treaty wasn't followed by peace, it was followed by a civil war. So politics dominated the agenda. When the fighting was finally over and the free state was established, boxing became extremely popular in the new National Army. Even though the sport had been invented by English gentlemen and brought to Ireland by the despised British military, amateur boxing escaped the foreign games ban. 
what they mean by foreign sports is English sports, but not all English sports, just English sports that are maybe identified with, say, the upper class, uh, like cricket, or English sports that are identified with the British military, like, say, soccer. So it's very selective. But boxing isn't one of those, and I think it's because the values of uh, boxing sort of transcend that kind of narrow sense of being associated with the upper British class or with, with the British military. And boxing is one of the things like, like swimming, for example, or athletics generally, which is just seen as, as international rather than just English in that pejorative sense. Boxing's journey from the British garrisons into the heart of Irish sporting culture was completed when the sport was featured as part of the Tolson Games in 1924. Reviving these games, essentially a Celtic Olympics, had been mooted by Michael Cusick and Morris Devon when they founded the GAA. When you look back on it, the Tolson Games were quite an extraordinary spectacle. You think of it, it was 1924. The Civil War is barely a year finished. The Free State is barely two years in existence. And the Irish Free State in that year organised a festival which was larger than that year's Olympic Games. The Tolson Games were to be an exhibition of the best in Irish sports, a celebration of the new Free State. It was decided that the competitions would be open to all people of Irish birth and also all people whose parents or grandparents were Irish. Boxing fitted quite nicely into that spectacle because, of course, it allowed the organisers of those games to include in the programme not just the very best Irish boxers, but it also enticed over various people who had taken part in the boxing at the Paris Olympics of, of, of 1924, notably uh, Purdy, for example, a New Zealander who won the welterweight title in, uh, in, in the Talton Games. He actually beat um, an Irish representative, Sergeant Patrick Dwyer, who, who finished fourth in that year's Olympic Games. There is actually extraordinary footage of, of Purdy throwing shapes out in the air, showing you his moves. And the newspaper reports uh, from that time talk of Purdy's extraordinary, extravagant style overpowering Dwyer uh, and how his sheer movement was, 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 was too much for Dwyer. In October 1926, boxing even became part of the reconciliation process with the old enemy. Less than five years after it had vacated the barracks, the British Army was back, ready to take on the Free State Army and loved combat in Dublin. Boxing brought Irish and British soldiers into friendly conflict for the first time. One of the strongest advocates of boxing within the military was General Owen O'Duffy, who reapplied his enthusiasm to the Garda Síochána when he transferred from the army. O'Duffy had been a leader in the War of Independence and a protege of Michael Collins. He commanded the Irish police and defence forces before emerging as Ireland's leading fascist in the 1930s. He is a very egotistical kind of character and, and there is this sense that he kind of shapes the police force to reflect um, you know, how he sees himself and how he sees the Irish Revolution. So it's very Gaelic, it's Catholic and it's Republican. So when these uh, boxing teams went off to France or went up to Belfast and had great results, you would read then later in the Garda uh, Journal how their greatness reflected on the greatness of the Commissioner and how it was a testament to uh, O'Duffy's brilliance. So, I mean, you can be a bit cynical about that, of course. But it is true that, that the Gardaí and the Gardaí boxing teams and so on um, reflected very well on what the Irish state was doing. So this, this is part of a really kind of ex exciting period of state building in the 1920s and 1930s. And it's, and it's very successful PR, not just for O'Duffy and the Guards, but for um, the government generally. Ireland's new military and police forces helped the sport emerge from the garrison to become the working man's sport. At that time, all the lightweight divisions for the army and all the heavy weights, say from uh, light middle up along, were generally Garda. And at that time, the uh, commissioner of the Garda had the idea of getting boxing clubs going in the different towns. So he would send out some of the people that were on the maybe the international boxing squad. And that did develop boxing in the entire country to a degree. O'Duffy saw local boxing clubs as a way of easing the guards into communities where, as outsiders, they were often regarded with suspicion. 
When O'Duffy was setting up the police force, to, the context was very important because it was in the middle of a, a civil war. Uh, and also the, 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 the Garda Shikona was an unarmed force. So you're sending these young men um, into quite disturbed parts of the country where they were facing the threat of the uh, armed IRA. And also they weren't uh, known. Public support is really crucial. You know, they had to win acceptance. And when they came into these areas, they could make contact with the community through setting up sports clubs and GA teams and hurling teams and so on, building handball courts at the back of police stations. They were able to sort of make a contact with, with the local community. The election of O'Duffy's deputy, Major General W.R.E. Murphy, to the presidency of the IABA in 1928 was a key moment in the organization's history. Under his charge, Provincial councils were established, and the first national juvenile championships were staged, which resulted in thousands of boys flocking to boxing clubs around the country. Within a few years, there were more than a hundred clubs affiliated to the IABA, with some three and a half thousand boxers donning the gloves. I was born in the North City uh, in Dublin in a place called Denmark Street. All around that uh, area, there was a, a few publicans who were interested in uh, helping kids who were in the, in the areas to uh, join boxing clubs, with, to get them off the streets, see. It really, like, it was, it was a, an ideal outlet for the tenements. There were hard times in it, and you didn't get any money out of the box or anything else, but you got the protection from your, uh, from, the evil deeds, you could just say, of somebody else, you know. They were never your evil deeds, they were all the evil deeds of somebody else. By the time I was uh, just just 11 year old, I had my first contest against Jimmy England. And uh, I needn't tell you I lost. <laughs> I just have a look at me. Uh, but most of the champions came out of the tenement areas. You'd have about seven or eight champions, like, in, in, a, in a small pocket, like, you know. The IABA staged many international bouts during the 1920s. An Ireland team travelled abroad for the first time in 1926 to fight the Germans, who became regular visitors to Dublin in subsequent times. Indeed, the first German boxing team to fight under the banner of the Third Reich in 1933 arrived in Dublin just a few months after Hitler's appointment as Chancellor. Visiting teams rarely came away from Ireland with a victory, and by the early 1930s, the leading lights of the national team were among the most popular sportsmen of their day. One of the undoubted stars of the time was Frankie Kerr from Belfast. He was the youngest uh, man ever to win a senior title in that he, he was only 16 when he won the title in 1932 and he actually won the, the trials to go to the Olympic Games in 1932 but somebody decided he was too young to go to the Olympic Games. He had a job in um, Belfast, he worked in Dunlops. He made sports equipment, he was involved in making tennis rackets and footballers. He came to Dublin through um, Father McLaughlin, who was highly involved in Arbor Hill Boxing Club, and he got a job in Dublin, also in Dunlops. His ability to fix tennis rackets was, was quite legendary. He was also a lucrative trade for him when times were difficult. Frankie Kerr won his six national titles in the 30s, when times were certainly difficult. But those who controlled boxing in Ireland were nothing if not ambitious. But no other boxing association in the world owned its own stadium, and no other would have taken on the task of raising 13,000 pounds without state help. The IABA built its own home, its own Croke Park. Prior to that, they used to hold the National Senior Championships in the, in the Army Barracks, or the, the police headquarters in, Phoenix, in the Phoenix Park. So they decided that, look, we're not gonna have this a nomadic existence going around all the different places. Let's get it, build a stadium. The National Stadium was built adjacent to Griffith Barracks. There was an old disused building on the site known as the Gun Room, which was converted into a gym. The foundation stone was laid in the summer of 1938, and by the following spring, the National Stadium was finished. This was the first and still the only purpose-built boxing stadium in the whole world. 
It was finished in 1939 to allow the European Boxing Championships, which after the Olympics were the number one boxing show on earth, because at that time there were no world championships. It was the Olympics and that was it. And the Europeans uh, were, were going, but they were never in Ireland. And in 1939, they were held right in the space. Well, it's remarkable. And on those first European championships, there were wins for two Irishmen. So that made it especially good. Jimmy Engel and Paddy Dowdell got gold medals. It seemed fitting that the first gold medal to be presented at the new stadium was to one of Dublin's own, 17-year-old Jimmy Ingall of Ringsend. And just a few hours after Ingall's win, Paddy Dowdell, another Dubliner, took the featherweight gold. Private Paddy Dowdell was an army man who was clearly well looked after by the butcher at Griffith Barracks next door to the stadium. He put a stake inside of his blinking thing here. And if he met Dowdle outside saying, having a point or something, slip it to him. And it'd be the best mistake. It'd be so lying and God knows what not. He, that dad had the control of the lot there. And while the stake was being smuggled out of the barracks, similar means were used to get Paddy Kilty into the stadium on the opening night. Somebody said, would you like to go to the stadium with your dad, Paddy? Of course I said, yeah. But then things went after that that I didn't come into. I know that they flanked me in. I was, I was smuggled in. That's the way I had to I was smuggled in. Paddy Dowdle got me in. Probably he was involved in the smuggling, but anyway. It was exciting, all right. Lights everywhere, you know. The boxers, they might as well have been foreign boxers for all I knew about them. But uh, it was an enjoyable night. Germans respect nothing. Latest evidence of this is their bombing of neutral era. Just as the National Stadium opened its doors, the world went to war, and international competition ceased for the next five years. Maybe this is the price era has to pay for sitting on the fence. But when the guns fell silent and some semblance of normality returned to people's lives, amateur boxing in Ireland embarked on a period of unprecedented popularity. And in cities like Belfast and Dublin, it became the working man's sport. Dublin was very, very alive with boxing clubs. There's a lot of a lot of clubs around Dublin area, you know, and the north side of the city as well. You know, there was always plenty of action in, in Dublin for the scrapping. You know, great. There were a plethora of clubs in the centre centre of the city. They occupied the basements of tenement houses. Gardner Street, York Street. But then, with the rapid expansion of the satellite towns at that time, Crumlin was one of the first. And Crumlin had a population of about 40 to 50,000 people. And there were very, very limited entertainment. So, therefore, boxing clubs started up all over Crumlin. I remember coming to the stadium here one time and there was eight weights on. There were seven boxers from Prumlin. So that, that gives you an idea of how attractive that boxing was to people in Crumlin and Ballyferm at Finglas, all these satellite towns, because they didn't have enough money. There was no work. 
Well, someone's had to go out and box. You have to remember too, the amateur boxing in name, it, it wasn't, uh, there was, if you got a club tournament, say with two big names fighting each other, you could nearly guarantee that there was money in it for them. I remember Jimmy Ingle, who was European flyweight champion in 1939. In his last amateur fight, he boxed one of his great rivals, Spike McCormick. And uh, Ingle was, got 10 pounds. And he thought, God, I did well here. And later he realized that McCormick, who lost the fight, got three times that much. But this is, uh, this is, this is amateur boxing. I think the, the authorities just turned a blind, blind eye to it. They were happy to see the crowds come along. <laughs> People who boxed in the Master Stadium, or anywhere else for that matter, got vouchers. You know, the vouchers could be for two to three pounds at that time. So uh, people would box probably every week in the stadium. They used to box every week. And they'd, they'd amass maybe seven or eight of these vouchers and then give them to their mother or father, who would then buy clothes, whatever, whatever. But that's what, that, that's, that's what happened. It was from the newly built streets of Crumlin that one of the real legends of Irish boxing emerged. Ollie Byrne started boxing as a schoolboy in the late 30s. And he was still donning the gloves in the 1970s after a ring career that lasted nearly 40 years. Ollie Byrne was going out. He had about five or six brothers and sisters. And he had, he, you know, he just went out and he boxed every week to put bread on the table. That's basically, that was it. He, he, it wasn't for the love of boxing. He just, he just had to do that. Then he grew, he grew to love the boxing, there was no question about it. He had his first fights in 1939 and his last fight, which I was asked, was 1975. So that's 36 years in amateur boxing. I'm sure it must be a world record. I certainly haven't come across anybody who could equal it. This is Ali Byrne, one of the most remarkable men of Irish sport, boxing a man less than half his age. His boxing career is as old as the stadium itself. There's quite a question mark over his age. A lot of people here say he's well over the 50 mark. He would still have been boxing, I think, only the IFEA advised, he said, I think it's time to call it a day, Ollie. He's just coming up to his 50th birthday. And on a majority vote, Ollie Byrne notches up yet another win of this remarkable career and certainly delights the crowd here. Well, they didn't really stop him, but they, had to, they brought in a rule that uh, you couldn't box after you were 34, which is a very good rule, you know, very good rule. But Ollie would have boxed forever, you know. But uh, he, was, he was a great character, a great character, you know. By the 1950s, the local boxing club had become a fixture throughout much of Irish society. Improvised gyms were set up in basements, pubs and church halls. And if there was little else to do, there was always the boxing. Sixpence, more or less, got me into boxing. Now, you might say, what's that about? Uh, I come from a place called Pierce Park in Drogheda. It was a, one of the biggest uh, council estates, probably about 2,000 kids. And my father wanted to keep us off the street in case we were into trouble. And he gave us a shilling, myself and my brother, and he says, go over and join the band. And there was a band over in Georgia Street, still there. Well, it's not there, it's a new place to have now. So we went over, we were all queuing up to go in to play, the, play the, because my, some of my father's people were musicians. He wasn't a musician, but he thought maybe there was a musician in his family. And we went over there, and we stood there at the door, a big, big crowd. And someone said in the, in the, at, in the crowd, they're only taking them into the boxing club for sixpence. So we decided we'd go to the boxing, because we had six months to spend. We had a shilling each, so we went to the boxing. So that's how I got involved in boxing. There was no other sport, really, as such. The school by football at that time started at 14 years of age. We could start boxing at nine or 10. And uh, well, a lot of us played football as well. But the, 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 the boxing was a great outlet, you know. And, particularly with the Imperial Tobacco Company. I mean, the first time I ever went outside of Dublin was to box as a schoolboy in Belfast or in Ballyharness or, you know, and it was a company, they were financing 
the, 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 the club at the time, you know. Men like heavyweight Jerry O'Coleman, Terry Milligan of Belfast, and Maxi McCulloch of Mullingar became the stars of the Irish boxing team, and they certainly knew how to pull a crowd. At the National Stadium Dublin, the Irish team climbed through the ropes to meet a group of young lads from Germany for an international boxing match that promises to be a pretty exciting show. I was aware of it growing up of the stadium because it was a place to come and a place to see the legends of Irish boxing because, I mean, they boxed other places too, like particularly Belfast and Cork, but this was the place. Here's the start of the bantamweight contest between Andy Reddy in Dark Vest and Germany's Amarain. The stadium was packed for junior championships, intermediate championships and senior championships. I mean, people couldn't get in here because of the crowds. Um, it was, and it was a tremendously popular sport among the working class people in Dublin specifically. Uh, this was their sport. Friday night, the working class, you know, down to the stadium every Friday night. Got the pay package on Friday and it was a great arena for, you know, great uh, rivalry there, you know, over the, over the years. It's terrific. I don't remember my young days coming here. The place would be packed with the rafters, you know. The volume of that enthusiasm in the crowds, the, you know, when the, the top notches would come into the ring was fantastic. I remember coming here down to the stadium and you couldn't get in. There was black back tickets outside. You know, I remember coming, looking for an international ticket. I ran all the way into Elvery's and I got a ticket. And I, I was, I was delighted. I got an international ticket. And that's how important it was at that time. A star-studded team of American champions arrived in Dublin in 1952. It was a huge event. Here the team was received by the American-born Prime Minister of Era, Irmán de Valera. The National Stadium was certainly booked out. For well, there wasn't a vacant seat when the visitors climbed into the ring preceded by the American flag. Against all expectations, the Irish team won the match with the fight of the evening featuring a 19-year-old from Belfast. They were the first team to travel after the war over to Ireland, you know, and that was bad. We were the first. So you couldn't get in that place for loving the money. Gold dust, no tickets, you know. I remember standing on the scales yeah, it's hard to believe it. I don't even it's eight stone three, you know, five foot nine, you know. And the American turn says, he'll do you, Jack Covino. We'll finish this brief glimpse of an Irish triumph with a third Irish win. It's McNally of Ireland and Corvino beating the living daylights out of each other, or trying to do so, in the Bantams. Didn't look tough. So he stopped it in, Jesus. <laughs> Shoulders and <laughs> no, Corvino was dynamite, you know, dynamite. Always said he was the hardest man I ever fought as an amateur. He was wild, he was just... <laughs> he, looked, he looked a lovely, lovely angelic face. Ah! That was all over. He could get his hands going to work, you know. Ireland first competed in an Olympic boxing tournament in Paris in 1924. Despite a few close calls, the team had failed to take a medal of any color until John McNally arrived in Helsinki in 1952. From 1948, that was when I first came across the Olympics. That just fired my imagination. I said to my father, I'm, I'm definitely going to go to the Olympics. He says, well, son, you're going to have to fight hard. I says, I know, you know, I've trained, I've trained hard. Turning to boxing, it's the final bout for the bantamweight title. Panty Hamalainen of Finland trading punches with John McNally of Ireland. McNally got all the way to the final, where he came up against the Finn Panty Hamalainen. A clash of heads in the second round cut McNally's eye. Yet at the end of three rounds of boxing, a first Irish gold seemed assured. When you got into the ring, it was going to be tough because there's 15,000 people there in Royal Finnish. <laughs> you, you know, there wasn't nobody for me there, you know, except my own mob. I thought it was home and dry as for a goal, you know, it did answer me after, after the way I was fighting, you know. It took a long time for me to come to the decision of, of the fight. I don't know what the hell they were doing, but they were 
to argue and no less Clark, you know. But eventually they give it to the Panty, Panty Hamalainen, that's his name, you know. Fair enough, you have nothing I can do about that. People say, what do you think, you think you want? And I said, it doesn't matter what I think, I would not change the, the thing. You know, if I had a spoke up, I, I might have changed the decision, I don't think so, you know. So you got to take it, take the cards as they come. John would never admit to you that he was robbed in the final, but I think most commentators will say that it was a hometown decision. The last thing you want to do is fight someone from Helsinki, in Helsinki, on the last day of the Olympics, when Finland did not want a gold medal. John got the silver, but John came home to Belfast and Ireland as a superstar. Belfast was blacked out. The streets were packed 